Welcome to Juniper Learning Bytes. My name is Zach Gibbs. I am a curriculum developer in the content development department and will be discussing proxy ARP in this segment. We will need to discuss what proxy ARP is and why it might be needed, but first let's briefly review how Ethernet works. This will set the stage for explaining a use case for proxy ARP. On an Ethernet broadcast segment, Layer 2 communication must occur before any Layer 3 communication can take place. And as you probably already know, this Layer 2 communication begins by using ARP packets. ARP allows IP-enabled devices to link the Layer 2 address, which is a MAC address, of a host with the associated Layer 3 address. If this process fails, or if the process just never occurs, Layer 3 communication cannot happen on an Ethernet broadcast segment. Well, now that we have reviewed the basic functions of Ethernet and how ARP links Layer 2 and Layer 3 addresses together, let's discuss what Proxy ARP is and discuss a situation where it might be useful to use Proxy ARP. Proxy ARP allows an Ethernet interface to respond to ARP requests for IP addresses that are not currently applied to an Ethernet interface. And at this point, you may be asking yourself, why in the world would you ever want an interface to respond to an ARP request for an IP address that it does not own? In a typical Ethernet network, you really do not want a device spoofing or telling other hosts in the network that it owns an IP address when it actually does not this could possibly lead to a very unstable network. However, there are some very specific situations where it might be necessary for an interface to respond to ARP requests for IP addresses that it does not own. Let's take a closer look at the network diagram we have here. The SRX device in the middle is providing internet access for the internal network which consists of host 1 through host 3. That internal network is using the IP address range of 10.1.10/24. And this SRX device is connected to an ISP router which is assigning the SRX device the public address range of 67.1.10/28. Now, as you might know, a slash 28 prefix range provides 14 IP addresses, but we can't use all 14 IP addresses in our scenario. I need to talk about SourceNet before I start talking about that. Okay, going to start over. <laughs> going to get it right this time. Let's take a closer look at the network diagram we have here. In the middle, we have an SRX device, which is providing Internet access for the internal network which consists of host 1 through host 3. Those hosts are, in, are within the private IP address range of 10.1.10/24. And to provide that internet access that they need, the SRX device must be performing a source NAT. And to accommodate source NAT, the ISP router has assigned the IP address range of 67.1.10/28 which means that we have 14 available addresses in that IP or inside that address range and as you might know a slash 28 may provide 14 addresses but we can't use all 14 in our source NAT pool because one address has to be used for the SRX's GIGI 004 interface and another address has to be used for the ISP router's interface, which is connecting with the SRX. So this leads us with a source NAT range of 67.1.10.3 to 67.1.10.14, which, as you can see in our little network here, it's more than enough. So for our scenario, we're going to turn off port translation, or PAT. And so... So what are 
our internal hosts will now want to do is to communicate with the outside world. They'll actually need to communicate with an FTP server that is located somewhere in the internet. It's a, using the uh, public IP address of 67.1.1.1. And so let's, let's jump to the router prompt right now and try that. Let's see what happens when these hosts attempt to communicate with the FTP server. And so here at the router prompt, we're on the SRX device. We're under the uh, security NAT hierarchy level. And I'll just show you the uh, configuration there. As you can see, we have the, uh, a source pool defined with the address range that we specified. PAT has been turned off with the port no translation command. And then we have a rule set that is doing the, uh, the source uh, NAT. You can see it's from zone trust to the untrust zone. We're matching on that internal prefix that we talked about. And then we're providing or we're uh, attempting source NAT with the pull that we specified up here. So pretty basic. And we're going to jump to host one. Host one is going to attempt to uh, FTP to the FTP server. And it may not be terribly surprising, but uh, it's not happening. Host one is not able to communicate with the FTP server. So we'll go ahead and cancel that operation. We'll jump back to the SRX device. And uh, can you determine, maybe guess what's going on here? It may be a little difficult at first. This is a situation that is kind of hard to troubleshoot because we really don't know what's going on with the router. Let's start back up that FTP session that isn't working. And what we'll do is we'll examine the router. We'll examine the security of, uh, flows uh, for FTP. And as you can see, there's a, uh, there's a security flow. There's a flow for this session that is happening. And as you can see that it's uh, coming in the uh, Gigi 8 interface and going out the Gigi 4, Gigi 004 interface. And you can see that the traffic that the SRX device is expecting back with the destination address of 67.1.10.7. This tells us that NAT is occurring. Let's look at the uh, NAT pull. Just specify all. We only have one pull, pull configured. Well, as you can see, we've had some translation hits here, which tells us that, uh, that the translation is occurring. The address is no longer being used, which means that there's no need to leave that session open on host one. And so NAT is occurring, but communication is not happening. Well, let's discuss the exact flow as it happens, starting a host one, going to the FTP server and we also have to keep in mind about the uh, return traffic. This is actually where the problem is, is actually with the return traffic. So let's look at our network diagram. Host one here is starting FTP traffic. He's saying, hey, we're going to go to 67.1.1.1. He initiates the traffic. It goes to the SRX device. The SRX device changes the source IP address to 67.1.10.7, which is within our NAT pool range. It goes to here. It goes to the internet router, goes to the internet, hits the FTP server. The FTP server says, okay, let's start this, let's start this connection up. It responds to 67.1.10.7, hits this ISP router. This ISP router says, hey, uh, I haven't communicated with 67.1.10.7. Uh, I need to send an ARP request on this, on this broadcast Ethernet segment. Well, he sends this uh, ARP request. It hits the only other host on here is the SRX device. It, that ARP request hits the SRX device on the Gigi 004 interface. Well, that interface, the only address applied there is 67.1.10.2. There's no .7 applied on that interface. That interface looks at it and says, must not be me. There must be another host on this Ethernet broadcast segment that has .7. And so he doesn't respond to the traffic. He has no idea that's actually meant for him. And so this is the perfect instance where proxy ARP is necessary. So let's jump back to the SRX device. Let's uh, configure proxy ARP. 
Ah, that's right, we have to specify the interface first, very important step. Actually, I'll jump into the interface so the, uh, the, uh, the text doesn't wrap around the screen there. And something uh, important to note here, notice that when I specified interface Gigi004, it actually, uh, the higher, hierarchy changed to Gigi004.0. Since I didn't specify a unit, it, the, uh, the Juno software assumed unit 0. Keep that in mind. If you need to specify a different unit, if you're working with a different unit other than 0 for an interface, you need to specify it or you're going to be configuring for unit 0 and it's not going to work. All right, let's set the address range. Dot three two six seven dot one dot ten dot one four. Uh, jump up two more or one more, and as you can see, there here's the proxy ARP configuration with the entire NAT configuration as well. So we'll commit that configuration, and while this configuration commits, uh, it's important to note a little caveat that you can't specify if you're specifying proxy ARP for an interface you can't specify that interface address in the range that you specify because it's unnecessary. The routers are already going to respond to that interface address. If you do that, the, you'll get a configuration error. You'll just have to change your configuration. Just, just a little tip to speed things up when configuring proxy ARP in this manner. And so let's, uh, let's try that communication again. <laughs> Would you look at there? It uh, works just fine. And so let's uh, let's examine the uh, uh, let's examine the router again. Look at the security flows for the session for uh, FTP. As you can see, it looks exactly the same, other than we are using dot four. Uh, and let's look at the uh, the source pool. Oops. Specify all. As you can see, we have translation hits, and we're using an available address. Communication is occurring. So we'll go ahead and, and uh, abort that session there. And while we're doing that, uh, let's actually. Yeah, well, actually, uh, as you can see, the uh, proxy ARP is comes into play here and is very key to allow communication in an instance like this. And what I showed you here with the proxy ARP in this scenario, this is how it is configured under the security NAT hierarchy. There's actually another form of proxy ARP that can be configured that I'll show you next, but there's some special considerations to be aware of. It's actually configured on the interface. So let's de delete proxy ARP under the security section, and let's jump to the actual interface. Now, as I configure this, I'm, well, before I mention, there's some special caveats to be aware of. And this is more of how uh, Ethernet works in general. Because what we're going to do here is we're going to specify a proxy ARP and use the unrestricted keyword. What this is going to do, this is going to allow the Gigi 4 interface, Gigi 004 interface on the SRX device to respond to any ARP request. Any ARP request it gets, it's going to respond to, which is fantastic for our situation. We're only going to respond to ARP requests that come in on this interface. We're the only host that can possibly respond to these ARP requests. Keep in mind, this is a very important. You have to be very careful with this if there's other hosts on an Ethernet broadcast segment. With the security uh, configuration, we can specify the range. If you have more than one host, I would highly recommend that you use the security NAT configuration to configure proxy ARP because you can specify the actual range of addresses. With the prox using the unrestricted command with proxy ARP, however, I would recommend that you only use it when this, when the when the host you're configuring for is the only host that can respond for that broadcast Ethernet segment, if you have other hosts that can possibly possibly respond, and you use the proxy ARP unrestricted command under an interface like this, you will have major troubles in your network. 
And so just keep that in mind as you go about using proxy art. Well, all right, now since I've given you that strict warning, uh, let's jump to the host and uh, let's try uh, the FTP uh, connection again. And as you can see, we get a login prompt. Things look beautiful. Let's jump to the uh, SRX device. Let's look at the, uh, the security sessions. Specify FTP for the application again. And as you can see, this is happening. Again, we are getting a, a security flow. And notice that before we used uh, dot four, now we're using dot three, 67.1.10.3. And so you can see that for different addresses, for each, each address that is used, the ISP device will have to send out an ARP request. And this is important because if we actually use the dot four address again, the ISP router would not need to send out an ARP request if it was soon enough that the ARP request or that the its ARP table didn't time out for the specific MAC address. We wouldn't have to worry about that. But since we're using dot three, the ISP router had to send out another ARP to uh, uh, fill in its MAC table. Uh, as you can see, communication is happening on the dot three address, and so things appear good here. Let's look at the uh, source pool. As you can see, we've got translation hits. We've got an available address being used. Uh, so everything is working as designed. Keep in mind, this is a difficult issue to troubleshoot if you don't understand how your network is configured, exactly what ARP requests are going out, because all the output that would uh, possibly provide information is about the same whether it's working or not. And so this concludes the proxy ARP section of Juniper Learning Bytes. Thank you for viewing this presentation, and I hope this information we covered in this section will be helpful to you. Visit the Juniper Education Services website to learn more about courses. View our full range of classroom, online, and e-learning courses. Learning paths, industry segment and technology specific training paths. Juniper Networks Certification Program, the ultimate demonstration of your competence. And the training community, from forums to social media, join the discussion.